I'm super excited about our panel for tonight. Really excited about the audience. We're gonna have some, I know you guys are gonna have some great learning, some great questions. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and, and get started. Just a few housekeeping things as we, uh, before we start. This is, um, for those of you who haven't had a chance to participate in the UDLIRN Network and Learn series before, these sessions are really interactive. We really encourage you to tweet, to, to post in the chat window on the Zoom, whatever, however you wanna uh, get involved, but we really wanna hear from you. So chat your comments, your questions, um, and we'll have a lively discussion tonight. Um, we'll hear a little bit more from our panelists in a bit and then have some question and answer time at the end. So make sure to, to, uh, to chat that stuff out to us and tweet it to us. So there's our UD, hashtag UDLIRN is where you can tweet. Um, also, we'll be streaming live, or we are streaming live now on YouTube Live. So um, if you check, scroll up in the chat window, that link is in there if you, in case you wanna join through YouTube Live. And, um, I just, uh, we're gonna do um, a little, this is what our agenda will be like for tonight. We have a 2020-20, so we're gonna split up this hour with a little variety of things. The first thing is, is we're gonna have our, we're gonna welcome our panelists, uh, let them set the stage a little bit about for the learning that we'll be doing tonight, let them share some of their experiences. Um, then we'll engage, each, each panelist will share a little bit about themselves and the work they're doing. Then we'll let them engage in some discussion around the topics and, sh and share some ideas and experiences. And then the last 20 minutes, approximately, we'll have some audience uh, question and answer. If you have a question, feel free to chat it out at any time. And um, we'll make sure we'll record those things so that we can ask those for you to our panelists at the end of the evening before we before we sign off. So um, just so you know tonight, we have um, some new facilitators tonight. Uh, Dr. Jamie Basham is going to be running the chat window on Zoom. So um, Jamie's the UDLIRN co-founder and CEO and pro Associate Professor of Special Education at University of Kansas. And he um, is going to be monitoring your questions and relaying those to our panelists at the end of the end of the evening tonight. So make sure to give a shout out to Jamie. And Mackenzie Nichols, um, the UDL IRN program assistant, and she's monitoring our Twitter feed tonight. So tweet your questions to Mackenzie or comments and she'll be able to, to relay those to our panelists at the end of the evening. And uh, my name is Corinne Hauer. I'm an assistive technology consultant at Muskegon ISD in, in Michigan. And I have the pleasure of working with Sue Harden and Brian Dean, who typically facilitate these sessions and they were not available tonight. I usually get to do uh, the, the jobs of posting in the chats uh, or uh, monitoring the chat feeds. And uh, so tonight I get to try my hat at um, the, uh, the hard jobs that Sue and Brian usually get to do. <laughs> so I'll do my best. And I think we're gonna have a great evening tonight. So now I, get the pleasure of whoop, introducing our panelists for tonight. So tonight we are gonna have some fantastic conversation with three really talented uh, UDL experts. And um, Kate Egren is the UDL coordinator for Bartholomew Consolidated School Corporation. And she's going to talk to us a little bit about the work that she's doing in Bartholomew. <clears throat> and um, give some experiences uh, and some advice. Uh, Jenna Gravel is, works for CAST as the Director of Research and Curriculum for Professional Learning. And Jenna's with us tonight, thank you Jenna. And Dr. Liz Berquist from the Baltimore County School uh, Corporation. And she is the Coordinator for Professional Learning there. And um, so we'll get to hear from, from Liz and the work that she's doing. So um, if you haven't um, stalked these people yet on Twitter or looked them up, make sure that you do. They've got lots of great uh, resources and advice, um, and we're I'm excited that we'll be able to learn more with them tonight. So without um, further ado, again, one more um, just reminder, chat your questions and comments out on Twitter. 
make sure to use that um, the chat feed in the Zoom window. Um, there is a question and answer uh, portion in Zoom. We encourage you to use the chat so that everybody can see your questions because the, your questions will spur questions from others too. So make sure you get out there and, um, and chat away. This is all about you and your learning tonight. All right, so without further ado, I'm gonna turn over um, the stage to Kate and let her give you a little bit more um, information about her UDL journey and the work that she's doing. All right, Kate. Are we there? Okay. All right. So my name is Kate Edgren. Um, I'm honored to be part of this panel um, and this discussion. Uh, my first picture here, I just put a picture of the bridge into Columbus because I think it symbolizes a lot uh, for me as an educator. This is what I drove on to get into Columbus for my first job interview. I really didn't know much about UDL, really nothing. Um, although I did recently find mention of UDL in some of my college materials when I was packing. So um, it really wasn't sticking at that point in my life, but um, when I drove down into Columbus, I have no idea what grand UDL adventure I was about to start on. So um, I had been a teacher for just a couple years when I got my job with BCSC, and at that point, they were kind of halfway into their UDL implementation journey. Um, so I started learning more about it, but um, just a few years into teaching with BCS as a science teacher in middle school, um, they made UDL imp implementation 50% of the teacher success rubric. So all of a sudden I realized it was something I really needed to learn more about. And so I had um, a UDL facilitator in my building that helped me implement and helped me design a more flexible learning environment and try new strategies. And um, a couple years after that, I took a job as a UDL facilitator myself um, at Schmidt Elementary. And that's one of our elementary schools in our district. And, um, you know, as a coach, I take a very relational and collaborative approach with UDL and implementing it in learning environments for different educators. But um, I will say when I first started as a facilitator in a, a coaching role, it was kind of like the next slide. So, um, kind of in your face and I had actually just had a baby. So I was coming off maternity leave and just had so much energy behind UDL and um, was just really excited to share what I knew about UDL and get people excited about it. And I think at that point I assumed I needed to just have all this knowledge and share it to teachers and that that was the role of, of the UDL facilitator. Um, but thankfully I have a pretty wise principal and he said, just to slow down and that my first priority should be building relationships with teachers. And I think that has definitely been key in my role as a facilitator. Um, so if you go to the next slide, um, I, like I said, I work in one building and I'm on the ground in the trenches with teachers. Um, we are working together in classrooms and with students. And I put pictures of the actual ladies that I work with. Um, and I'm sure there's some men in there too. We just don't have a ton of them in elementary world. Uh, but anyway, they represent individual variable learners. And I think um, we talk about a lot about that with students in terms of UDL and how there's so much variety, but um, I think sometimes we forget that adults learn differently too. And so that advice to really build relationships first was so key. So now I know all these beautiful people and I really strive to get to know them and what their passions are, um, what types of things they just really love to teach and what types of things are harder to teach. Um, and I think that's really been key in my facilitation of adult learners. But then also instead of just sharing all of the UDL guidelines, which can be a little overwhelming and just a lot to take on, um, focusing more on really specific, personalized, individualized 
um, goals that teachers may have and trying to make them really clear, trying to figure out some data that we can collect to see if our work together is being effective and um, just narrowing down from that fire hose approach <laughs> to more of a specific and personalized approach for the teachers that I'm working with. Um, and that obviously looks a lot different and um, my job looks very different from day to day, but um, that's what my UDL work looks like now. Um, I was just in a classroom yesterday, started with an observation, and I actually um, linked to some of the tools I use in my work just to give you some ideas of what that may look like. Um, at BCSE, we focus a lot on the learning environment, so we do a lot of observations of just the physical space and um, different strategies that are implemented already, and then um, focus on ones that we can add in and then get more specific if needed. So that's kind of what my job looks like right now. And again, awesome. click, on, click on that link to see some of the tools that I use. And, Kay, um, and I don't have the chat. Is, did you throw that link up in the chat window? Is that where, or is it actually? Oh, um, you know, I linked it, the actual picture, I think, but maybe I didn't. But oh, on this right here on the toolbox? Yeah, does it go to it? I forgot that maybe. We, there we go. There we go. Cool. Um, I'm going to go ahead and if I can throw this. We'll, um, we'll go ahead and throw that <clears throat> link up in the chat. <clears throat> Excuse me, so everybody can can check it out here. If I can do that quickly. Thank you. Yeah. Oops, it's not letting me right now. I can try to do it too. Okay, sorry. I was trying, for some reason it's not letting me copy and paste it. But um, so you really have taken that from that fire hose, you've really found that applying the UDL framework to your um, interactions with teachers and um, really getting specific and giving that, that feedback through data collection has been a, a helpful strategy and moving your work forward. Yes. yes. Very cool. Um, and then from that, that well, how did you find, I'm just curious, um, so talk a little bit, how did you find that from sharing knowledge to building relationships, um, what uh, were some of the things that you found as key to, to helping you make that shift um, from just telling to, to really more the listening? Um, well, I think my goal was to just find a connection with, with teachers. My job is by request only, and I'm non-evaluative, so there's no pressure or obligation to work with me, and so um, that's great. I think that makes teachers want to work with me, and um, you know, they're not being forced to do it, which doesn't usually go well for students or adults, but anyway, mm -hmm. Um, just figuring out a way that they would want to work with me and um, and offer just different ways that I could even collaborate with them, learn from them. Some of the teachers that have been a little resistant or maybe not interested, just even me taking that first step of, hey, I, I've heard about this structure that you have in place or this option that you use or this strategy, um, this way that you're setting up your day or your reading stations and even connecting with teachers that way has been really effective just to help start a collaborative relationship and and for me to help get to know them better and get a chance to sit in their room and see what their learning environment is like um, but i think it you know again just like students they they there needs to be a relationship built on trust and um, so anything that i i can do to um, just get to know them better and find a point of connection has been has been a key to my to my work for sure so I'm um, approaching that that partnership as almost being an equal learner um, and, as well as a facilitator has been a, a key. For sure, and it's genuine too. My background's secondary, so especially the first couple years, I could definitely, I had so much to learn about what elementary world was like. And so that was just being humble enough to say, hey, I have no idea how to teach second grade reading. Can you help me understand your goals for this curriculum and, and how we can assess what's what's really going on here. And then, then I can come in alongside as a UDL 
um, somebody who knows about UDL maybe more than second grade reading and offer those universal guidelines and checkpoints that we know are going to help reduce barriers and um, just help make learning environments more accessible and flexible for students. Very cool. Very cool. Um, all right. Well, I'm not going to, I have lots of questions. I'm not going to take up the whole stage because I'm sure other people have lots of questions too, but um, thanks for sharing your, your story and give us a little background knowledge and giving um, a little context to your situation. We're going to go ahead and move on to uh, Jenna. I think, um, let me see if I'm, am I on the right slide here? Jenna's at the beginning of yes. your, all right. <laughs> All right, so Jenna Gravel from CAST, um, Director of Research and Curriculum. Is that, do I get that correct? That's right, uh, Director oh. of Research and Curriculum for Professional Learning at CAST. Yeah. All right. Um, and also, so also a mom of three, and it's bedtime in our house, so I just <laughs> want to warn everyone, you might hear some background noise. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. We totally we get that, um, and that's fine. We love little faces, so that's all okay. good. Okay, hopefully so, they're all bad. So hopefully you won't see that. <laughs> hopefully not. So tell us a little bit about your, your UDL journey, your current work in supporting uh, learning and implementation. Great. Um, so I first learned about UDL as a master's student at Harvard Graduate School of Education. I took David Rose's UDL course in the spring and got totally hooked on UDL. Um, I graduated that spring really ready to apply UDL to my practice as a middle school special educator but I graduated in the spring and wasn't going to start teaching until September. So I reached out to David to see if CAST had any summer positions available. Um, and he said that I could help him with a small summer project that he was calling CAST's UDL guidelines. Um, so that was in the summer of 2005, and we came out with the first version of the guidelines in 2009. So it was definitely not exactly a small summer project. Um, but really led to so much learning for me and I just for me and I felt um, so lucky to be able to work with such a committed team at CAST to be a part of the development of our UDL guidelines. Um, so on this slide, you can see one of the first versions that we came out with in 2009. And then on the right, you can see our newest version of the guidelines that we actually just came out with um, this past January, which we're really excited about. Um, so I continued to work at CAST about like one day a week when I was teaching. And I joined the organization full time in 2007. And during that time, uh, my work focused really on developing this first iteration of the guidelines into a much more robust support for educators and curriculum designers and researchers. Um, I played a role on the team to launch our UDL National Center website, where we were able to store all of our research behind the guidelines. We had lots of videos of UDL being applied to real classrooms. Um, we had lots of resource and, is, resources and examples too to really be supporting teachers to be thinking about how can we apply UDL to the classroom. And I think in those earlier days, we were realizing there was so much energy around this idea of UDL and people were, were really excited about the three principles, but then saying like, so how do I start applying this to practice? And we really hoped that more fully developing the guidelines and all of the different kinds of resources we were putting on the National Center site would be a good first step. Um, and it was great that so many different um, stakeholders are really good about sharing their feedback with us and ideas for making guidelines even better. Um, and the more that I was learning from these different perspectives, I became really interested in more fully understanding what was really happening when educators started applying UDL to practice. And I really wanted to dig into like that classroom level kinds of data and explore what happens to student learning when teachers are applying UDL and also really think about teacher growth over time. And so those research interests inspired me to go back to Harvard for my doctorate. And there I focused on the intersection of UDL and this idea of disciplinary thinking. So the idea of um, the specific practices and habits of mind and commitments that would be unique to each discipline. So if you don't mind going to the next slide. So the students in this picture are fifth graders at a full inclusion public elementary school. And I had the opportunity to do a pilot study in their classroom um, as part of my qualifying paper for my doctoral program. And I was able to observe the ways in which their co-teachers applied UDL to encourage all of their learners to engage in really sophisticated discipline specific thinking right within the content of English language arts. So I was just focusing on ELA. 
And it was really inspiring for me to observe how all of these students, students with and without disabilities, were really able to engage in the rich practices and habits of mind of the discipline. But the teachers who I were observing were co-teachers who were very seasoned educators with a wealth of experience applying UDL to their classrooms. And these teachers also possessed a really deep belief in the potential of all learners. So throughout my pilot study, as I'm collecting data, I kept asking myself, how can we be supporting other teachers who are less familiar with UDL to be doing the same kinds of work? Um, and in my own practice and some of my work with other teachers, I was realizing that oftentimes we, when we're new to UDL, we equate UDL with this idea of access, kind of with that top row of the guidelines, which is so critically important. And it's such a huge step forward that we are thinking about UDL in terms of access. But the observations that I was doing in this classroom showed me that these teachers were going beyond access and really thinking about how they can be leveraging UDL to engage all of their learners to become those expert learners within a particular content area. So that question led me to my dissertation and I had the opportunity to work with three different teachers, a fourth grade teacher, a fifth grade teacher and a seventh grade teacher. And we explored this question of how can we support educators to apply UDL in ways that are encouraging all of their learners to engage in these really rich, sophisticated kinds of thinking, again, focused on that content area of ELA. And I was able to collaborate with each teacher to design lesson plans and projects, all kind of with this goal of that intersection of UDL and disciplinary thinking. And if you go to the next slide, um, you'll see a picture of one of the fourth grade teachers who I worked with and some of her students. And then next to that picture, you'll see kind of this diagram of this iterative cycle that um, each of the teachers were at and I were able to engage in, where we would, um, they would come up with an idea for a lesson plan or a project or a scaffold that they wanted to co-design with me. And we would do that during a regular um, meeting that we would have. And then we would try out the idea. I would videotape and observe and collect all the students' work. And then we would meet again to reflect on the video footage and the student work and make little tweaks and refinements and then kind of start that iterative cycle over. So the teachers and I were able to get gather a real wealth of evidence of the really sophisticated kinds of thinking that the students were able to engage in when we applied UDL in this really discipline specific kind of way. Uh, and the richness of the thinking that the students and that the students were generating and that the teachers were really gaining evidence of really began to um, support them to kind of rethink some of their expectations about students' capabilities. And I was also able to kind of document this learning on the teacher side too, where they were um, able to kind of get this new understanding of the promise of the UDL framework. And it allowed me to start to understand some of the specific features and processes that work to support teacher growth, especially around UDL. And I finally finished my dissertation, um, my doctoral program after seven years, and I just started at um, CAST. I graduated last spring, so I'm now at CAST. And it's been really fun for me because I feel like I'm able to take all of this learning that I learned through my doc program and apply it directly to my work at CAST, where we are really dedicated to supporting educators to be applying UDL to their practice in ways that really are engaging all learners in these challenging, challenging ways of thinking. Um, and as a professional learning team, we're working to be a lot more intentional about the ways that we're collecting data. And we really want to be kind of gathering a really rich archive of data to explore changes in teachers' practice and beliefs, along with their uh, kind of trajectories of learning to apply UDL to their practice. And we're also working to start really um, collecting a lot of student data in terms of gaining a much more thorough understanding of what's happening when teachers are being supported to apply UDL to their practice. Um, so we've been learning so much from the teachers and the students who we've been working with. So it's just been a really exciting process. And I think that's all for now. I know. I okay. Know. Well, <laughs> well, that's that's pretty significant. So I I have um, a ton of questions. Of course, I'm hoping that um, that you'll have some more information about the, the, the data collection pieces and how you collected data both on, so you were really approaching this for, um, uh, for um, two purposes. One, to see the impact of um, how, what your impact is a, in terms of coaching and co-designing lessons and that reflection, that iterative cycle of design, um, how you could help support that in teachers, uh, and then what the effects of that were on student growth as well. 
Yeah, and yeah. I think that really um, key to our process was this ability, because I was, we were definitely collaborating, but I was in this researcher role where I was able to collect tons of data. Um, I think I had like hundreds of hours of video footage from their classroom. I was observing three days a week over the course of a whole school year. Um, we were meeting about once a week, the each teacher and I, and we collected, you know, over 300 pieces of student work. So we just had this wealth of data to really pour over when we were meeting and think about, so what was our goal for this lesson? Did we see students realizing that goal? Were we really seeing evidence of this kind of um, rich, sophisticated thinking within ELA? Uh, and then being able to say, if we did, what did we do right? And if we didn't, what can we tweak, tweak and do again? And I really think it was that iterative process of kind of just trying things out and seeing what happened that also kind of lowered the stakes for the teachers. Like it didn't feel like a lot of pressure to need to apply UBL in these like perfect ways because I don't think that's possible at all. Um, but really just to be kind of in that experimentation mode of thinking, here's a cool idea. Let's leverage UDL in this way to hopefully engage students in this kind of thinking and see what happens. So by, by joining with them in that process, it made um, it less intimidating and less, uh, you're really helping to show the educators that there isn't, there isn't a one way to this. There isn't a right or wrong. It's about that, that continual um, reflection and redesign. Um, very cool. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna save a, more for questions from the audience when we get to that that portion. But um, I'm really intrigued and, and would love to learn more about uh, the specific data that you were showing or are reviewing both with your teachers and then about your teachers growth too. That um, um, sounds like all things that are gonna help move the field forward. So I think that's awesome. And then the other lesson learned is that if um, David Rowe should ever ask you to engage in a small project, it can <laughs> run in the opposite direction. Right? That's right, it wasn't so small, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and for those of you who haven't seen the new guidelines, you have to check them out. Um, they're incredible, they're just a phenomenal resource, they're interactive, they're so much less um, I think um, less threatening than, than yes, the old yes. ones used to be. Um, <laughs> I've had a lot of teachers I've worked with over um, multiple years and they see those and went, oh, this is, this is perfect. This is what I've been looking for. So yes, so job yes, extremely you, well done on those. Those were, were wonderful. Um, okay, so um, thank you, Jenna, for sharing that awesome information. Can't wait to hear more about that. And um, we're going to move now to, um, Liz Berquist. Um, and Liz, I, I think from the last time that I stopped you, you've changed positions or changed schools because I kept sending things to the wrong email address. But uh, so, so Liz, you're now um, in charge of UDL professional learning for, um, Barth, or for uh, Baltimore. So um, all sorts of professional learning for the Baltimore County Schools, which is actually pretty neat since we're talking about our UDL journey because that's where I started as a teacher. Um, I began my career there. And I remember the very first time I heard about UDL, it was when I was in my master's program in special ed in 2000. And um, it really was kind of living in special education at that point. And fast forward a couple years, I um, was working on my admin in the central office. And I remember being at a meeting and saying, why are we adding all of these supports and scaffolds after the fact and not at the beginning? And um, this person that was sitting with me, her name's Marcy Kaplan. She works at our state department now. She said, well, you know, haven't you heard of UDL? And I was like, wait a second. You know that's that's for all so that really kind of started to pique my interest in looking at the UDL framework to kind of meet that challenge of variability and address the fact that we have a lot of different types of, of learners in our classroom and, and we need to think about those barriers that they're experiencing and find a way to remove them and uh, the UDL framework really lets us do that so that's when I started to really dig into what that framework looks like and I ended up doing um, a lot of my all of my doctoral work around um, UDL and in that work um, that 
connected me with CAST and I ended up um, on the faculty cadre and just being able to work with them and um, being able to spend so much time there with a group of really committed, dedicated um, people around UDL, um, that, that really was pretty awesome um, being part of my, my journey. Um, and then from there, I spent um, about eight years in higher ed um, and I taught courses on UDL and in that time I also did a lot of consulting and grant work and different projects um, through CAST and then also through the university um, with, with different school districts across the US and that is what I kind of pictured here because I feel like this text really sums up um, a lot of my initial UDL journey. So I'd really, I'd say, you know, even though um, UDL was defined in the 90s at CAST, it really was the past like 12, 13 years that we've really been um, focusing on like serious efforts for UDL implementation. So moving from like, what does, like, what is UDL? What does it look like? But then, you know, how is this actually implemented in schools? So in the text, there's um, different stories from um, different districts and schools and um, just just classrooms of, um, <laughs> hi, bedtime, I see it, so cute. Um, so just, it, it really goes through wherever you are with implementation, you can find um, a case study that could maybe help you think about the professional learning that's required to get the group that you're working with to move from exploration to preparation to integration and then hopefully um, to scaling and optimizing. And that graphic is um, CAST graphic on UDL implementation and it looks nice and simple and easy but it really is this iterative process and even in one building you know I was just um, talking with um, the picture at the bottom is Chavez High School and they're in their fourth year of a really intense UDL implementation project and they've got people in all different different phases here. So so that's that's really important that um, regardless of where you are in your journey it, it's it is a process and there are implementation dips and there are um, you know it's really important to, to prepare um, experiences for people and especially in a school district or in a school that meet each one of those phases and help move people along so you know that's why I, I wanted to kind of start with that because I feel like um, the, the people who, who wrote in this text really are part of, of my UDL journey and being able to learn and work with so many awesome people in the field. Um, Kate's, Kate's district is, is in there and so many people from CAST are, are part of the work that's, that's in this text. Um, I, I feel like it's just, you know, a collaborative effort. Um, I think about my UDL journey, but it's really all of our UDL journey. And that's the beauty of being in the UDL field is that it's so collaborative and everybody wants to help each other. Um, everybody wants to, to contribute to help, help people move forward. So that's kind of my personal spin on it. And then the next slide, you asked us to talk a little bit about what we're currently doing. So about a year and a half ago, I returned to, to Baltimore County where I started, and um, I do work in professional learning. And it's it's been pretty neat because it's a huge school district. We've got almost 113,000 students, 10,000 teachers. And um, my role is to design and deliver professional learning for teacher leaders and administrators. And one of the groups that I work very closely with is our staff teachers. And um, we actually, that's our you know fancy name. We let our students name them, but really they are um, job embedded instructional coaches. And there's 173 of them. And there's one for each building. So it's, it's pretty powerful to see them in action and also to realize that in um, designing professional learning for this group, we really do have the potential to touch every single teacher in the district because there is one person whose full-time role is job embedded professional learning. And um, working with them has really helped me to think a lot about adult learning, to think about the elements of effective professional learning, to think about coaching. And um, we meet we meet monthly formally for a conference. And in that conference, we have whole group sessions where we talk about district initiatives, but then we also do um, deep dives around topics that are really um, important to 
um, instructional coaches and um, we they're all in coaching sessions and they also all um, have the opportunity to do some choice sessions depending on what they need so really the conference itself models the UDL framework there's a lot of choice and we recognize that there's so much variability in those 173 professional learning specialist in the district. Um, and anytime I'm presenting them or working with them, everything that I do is grounded in the UDL framework. So they hear a lot about um, what UDL should look like for adult learners and in professional learning, but then they also translate that to um, what they should be working with with their teachers when they think about transitioning from a traditional environment to a learner-centered environment. So um, UDL is really the foundation of what we do in our classrooms. When we go in, we expect to see options for engagement and representation and action and expression. And we, we teach our professional learning teachers that that is um, really your tier one instruction. Like when we, when we think about just what is effective first instruction, what are universal supports for all of your students, um, that's, that's what it is. It's grounded in UDL. Um, so that's a lot of the work that, that I'm doing now. And then um, the next slide, I know we wanted to, to really hone in on just tips for professional learning. So I just highlighted a few things that are really important to, to, to me and to our team when we design professional learning. We have a great team of people that work together um, to really ensure that um, people are thinking about our students in the margins from the beginning and really designing with um, this UDL lens. But um, last year, uh, this Learning Policy Institute put out these seven uh, elements of effective professional learning. So um, at UDL IRN at the summit in a couple weeks, I'm gonna be talking about uh, universally designed PD and how these um, components paired with the UDL guidelines make for a really powerful experience for teachers. So that's a little plug for the session if you're interested in um, learning more about universally designed um, professional learning, we'll be spending time kind of crosswalking the um, effective elements of PD with um, with what we know about UDL. So I really feel like the process of designing a professional learning should really mirror the lesson planning process and the learning environment design process that Kate talked about. So if you're responsible for professional learning and you're also responsible for a universal design in your district or your school, you really need to consider that proactive learning environment and those supports um, when you think about your goal and you think about your assessments and then when you're choosing your um, materials and your methods for your PD. So whenever you're presenting on UDL, you really want to make sure you're, you're modeling um, UDL as well. So we'll be focusing in on that. And then um, I've also started to spend a lot of time exploring adult learning and coaching. So really thinking about the needs of adults. We were all trained in pedagogy to work with, with children, but we need to really expand our learning when we're working with adults. And um, it's, it's important um, to think about those foundations of, of adult learning and adults needing to feel safe to learn and recognizing their history and knowing why and allowing adults to be self-directed. And if you really dig into that, that sounds a lot like the UDL guidelines. So there's some really great connections between adult learning theory and effective professional development and the UDL guidelines. And and that's the, the work that I'm trying to do now. And that other set of pictures there is just a just one little capture of a professional learning community. Um, the one PD model that that really um, exemplifies those seven effective elements of PD is a PLC. So I'm a firm believer in a true professional learning community. A lot of the work in, um, in the text that I referenced before and the work that we do in our district is grounded in learning communities um, because that is really participant driven and it's a departure from the traditional PD and you really can in that type of setting apply the UDL guidelines to the work that you're doing with teachers in a PLC. So um, that's something that I, I love to, to discuss if anybody wants to talk about that. Um, we'll also be doing a pre-conference session at um, the summit where we're talking about our work at Chavez, which is grounded in leadership professional learning communities and teacher professional learning communities. So more on that later. Um, yeah, and if you um, if you haven't read Liz's book yet and you're um, responsible for UDL professional development um, and and need some uh, strategies or some stories to help people get engaged. It's, uh, it's a fantastic resource. Um, it's a great book. Um, the, and if you haven't participated in one of Liz's um, sessions before, she definitely lives and breathes UDL. I mean, and if you can fit in um, choice and um, 
you know, multiple options for learning in a one hour breakout session um, at a conference with people from a really wide variety of places and roles and responsibilities, um, then you're, you know UDL. So she uh, definitely does that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, very nice. Thank you. Um, so really for you uh, taking that, um, just stopping the madness of the retrofitting is where your journey started. And now you've taken it from that, like up multiple levels. So it, now it's about applying, modeling and applying UDL for, um, for your district staff who are responsible for modeling and, and teaching UDL to other staff. So it's, it's multiple layers at that time. But like you said, just that being able to infuse that in those people sends that ripple effect really throughout the teachers across the district and across the county. Yeah, there was a lot of done on that um, and at the state level because um, in 2012, Maryland was the first state in the nation to have legislation on UDL. So it's in our code and there were some really amazing people um, behind that work. Denise DeCoste, who used to be, um, still is involved in the UDL IRN, but is retired, um, but still very active. Um, she was an amazing um, proponent for that to happen, as well as our former state superintendent, Dr. Grasmick. So having it in our, our code of Maryland definitely helped um, propel that forward. And um, the other group that was really instrumental in that was our families of our mm -hmm. children with exceptionalities. And then other families realized, you know, this is something that works for all kids. So let's, let's get behind this. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Um, thank you, Liz, for sharing your um, story and for Je Jenna and Kate. And we're going to um, we're going to open this up now to a little bit of a panel discussion. I'm just going to ask a couple of quick questions that I want to um, leave, make sure that we're leaving time um, to uh, get, make sure that we have questions. We have time to post questions from the audience. So um, if I, um, the first thing I just wanted to ask, just kind of some general um, keys to success. I think, you know, some of that we've mentioned already, but if there are other things that you think that are highlights for people to really grab onto right now, what have been some of the keys to success in supporting that learning and implementation of the UDL framework and, and the teachers that you've worked with? So, and whoever wants to start. I'm going to jump in just because I just saw um, a comment from um, Pamela in the chat about Elena Aguilar. So I, I want to um, just acknowledge, I, I put her quote up there, but I think that um, coaching, and Kate talked a lot about this too, having a coach um, is really one of the um, biggest ways to move people from exploring and preparing to integrating. And I, um, I credit a lot of uh, the work that we did with Ka um, CAST in the Gates Foundation Implementation Project around um, exploring what is the role of a coach um, in working with UDL implementation? What is the role of a non-evaluative coach in a professional learning community? Um, so, so that really started there and they developed some great resources and now the, the field is starting to kind of catch up with that. And there are people who are, um, have a lot of, of great materials out there just on coaching, like Jim Knight, Elena Aguilar, and um, and she's at, Aguilar actually is coming out with a book this spring called Onward, and it's about building emotional resiliency in adults. And again, when I read some of the previews and I went to her conference, there's such an amazing connection with applying the UDL guidelines to adult professional learning and building up the resiliency of adults in our building through this coaching model. Um, I, I really encourage anyone who's thinking about UDL professional learning to also look at coaching as, as, a, as a method or a vehicle to help people move through those phases of implementation. And one of the other features I, I think I found with my dissertation work uh, was really like the power of uh, exploring student work in terms of supporting teacher growth. And what I found was seeing evidence of students exceeding teachers' expectations really supported teachers to develop new understandings about the potential of UDL. And I think this evidence supported some of the teachers to kind of rethink the expectations that they had for some of their students. And when I first started out collaborating with the three teachers, and saying, you know, we're going to use UDL to engage all of your learners in these really sophisticated kinds of thinking in ELA. Teachers were great because they were really honest with me, but some of them were a little hesitant and say, I teach inclusive classrooms. I have kids with lots of different strengths and weaknesses. One of the teachers who I worked with 
taught um, an English language arts class only for kids with language-based learning disabilities. So some of the teachers were a little hesitant saying, I'm not quite sure, like this sounds like a great idea, but I'm not convinced that this is going to work and that just applying UDL is going to support my learners to engage in these kinds of thinking. And then having the piles of student work that we were able to collect and seeing here's a student who you weren't quite sure was able to kind of reach this really challenging goal. And here's evidence of them doing that. You know, the teachers able to point that out and say, wow, like I never thought that this was possible to see this. And I think uh, kind of supporting teachers to see that success, like they're trying UDL and look at what's generated in their classroom, look at the kinds of thinking among their students. And I think really being able to create professional learning experiences for educators where they see that success kind of early on, even if it's just a really small step, I think that's what's really motivating to continue with the journey of UDL. So um, my one of the keys I guess I'll share is that um, I go by this motto of tough skin, soft heart. And I think uh, doing professional learning or coaching is just a totally different ball game because you're working with your peers. And um, I personally would much rather work with young kids. I just think it's a it feels safer. And so um, as a coach or somebody who's trying to help uh, adults grow and help professionals learn, um, I've had to, to grow some tough skin and be, be okay with getting feedback and responding well to that feedback and also being uh, persistent when needed, but then also to not forget what it's like to be a teacher and, um, or a principal. I, I don't know what that's like, but just having empathy for um, whoever it is that I'm working with or whoever my audience is and, and trying to remain in touch with uh, what, what they're going through and what they're doing. So um, tough skin, soft heart, it would be one of my keys I'll pass along. Um, thank you guys for sharing. I think those are all awesome. So they, definitely the coaching um, and, and then some of the, the strategies within the coaching that, that um, like you said, just said, Kate, that being just vulnerable and, and okay and accepting of, of the, what it takes to build that relationship and that building that evidence. I imagine having that evidence, um, Jenna, well, it just helps that part flourish too, that if you make it about the, the evidence and the students and the student work, um, it, it helps to, to build that relationship and trust. Um, yeah, I see that. Tough skin, soft heart. Yes. So um, we have a, a couple of questions. I'm going to shoot over to um, to Jamie. I think he had a couple of questions from the audience. We're just going to jump into that um, real quick so we make sure we have time to address our audience questions. So Jamie, do you have a couple of questions from the from the chat or Mackenzie from the Twitter feed that you um, people want to ask the panelists? Sure, we have some questions. Uh, it's been a great panel and, and and exciting to listen to what everyone's doing and always incredible to hear what's going on across the field and both the similarities and differences. Um, I think one of the first questions we received uh, was really to Kate, but I think it um, can probably go to all of you, which is, uh, you know, she, she specifically framed it around the guide, guidelines. Uh, I think Amanda sent it in, but like how many, how many guidelines do you try to work with it with an individual at any given time? And how do you avoid it becoming too overwhelming? Or do you even start with the guidelines? I'll add that in there. Maybe maybe start with something else. I'll start. Never start with the guidelines <laughs> because it's about the mindset shift. Um, and I, those of you who've heard me talk about this, I feel like I say it all the time. Um, but UDL really is a conceptual change for a lot of people, classrooms, grade level teams, schools, districts. So uh, to me, I think the most important thing is to start with that mindset shift. Um, believing that learner variability is the norm, thinking about identifying barriers from the beginning and trying to remove them with what we can control in, in the environment. Um, and then the other, um, I think, big misconception about UDL is that you just, let's apply it to uh, a lesson plan or a unit plan. And I will, admit that when I first started a lot of this work and we would do trainings, we'd say, oh, bring a lesson and let's start, you know, looking at a lesson. We don't do that at all anymore. Now we talk about the learning environment first and um, that really is much more impactful. So we take those um, 
amazing UDL guidelines, and I love the revision that, um, that CAST has, has done, and or this new iteration, and applying that to the learning environment first, and thinking about what options you can put in place in the learning environment, regardless of, of what you're teaching your lesson or your unit. Because if those things are in place, it's going to make the lesson planning process more efficient um, in the long run. And then you can start to, to drill down a little bit deeper into like long range planning and variability in units. But um, mindset shift, learning environment design first. Yeah, I like that. I like that. I like that. I, it's kind of actually similar to the way when I work with teams, it's how we approach it too. Knowing the guidelines are critically important, but also thinking about how do we actually move, move them along in their understanding. Uh, Kate, Jenna, uh, thoughts on that? So, I agree. I'm oh, sorry, Kate, I, I cut you off. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, so in my work, you know, my district has been implementing it for a while. And so some in have heard about it for a long time, maybe even half of their teaching career. So I think some are ready once we look at that learning environment design um, and I, I help them with observations, we can really pinpoint some specific areas, especially if they have an understanding of what even that principle is. So maybe they really want to focus on action and expression because they want to focus on appropriate goal setting. So maybe they're ready for a really specific goal that they want to set. It's a professional goal or a need that they've seen in their classroom. Um, but then we also have brand new teachers every year. And so we start by, like Liz said, that mindset shift and really understanding how they can apply the UDL guideline or the framework to that. I keep saying guidelines the framework to their learning environment. And I think that immediately helps it to not feel overwhelming. Like these are 30 plus things I need to do every single time I'm teaching a lesson. Um, that's not, you know, that's not the approach we're going for. Um, and then some people that are new, they just need to think about engagement. How are you really helping kids get excited about your learning environment and, and take a more broad approach, but kind of narrow down in engagement first. And then we can move on to thinking about representation, but it really does depend on the teacher. And again, I'll go back to just building a relationship with them and getting to know them and their understanding of the framework before uh, you get to the fire hose scene that I referenced earlier. <laughs> so Jenna, as, as uh, the author of the guidelines, um, uh, you know, so I, I, I was just happy to actually hear you. And I've heard you say this before about uh, David approaching you with this project. <laughs> Because we're working on a fairly sizable project right now, you and I and yes. some others. <laughs> so I'm glad you just yeah. get thrown into these situations all the time. Kind of like I do, I think, at times. Um, <laughs> but for, as the author of the guidelines, how, I mean, how do you recommend maybe using them in, the, in, in that environment in the context that we've been talking about them here? Yeah. And just an author. We worked with a big collaborative team at CAST that I was really glad to be a part of. Um, but I totally agree. I think, Liz, your image of the fire hose is perfect when thinking about the guidelines because I think the, the three principles, the nine associated guidelines, the 31 associated checkpoints, like that can just feel super overwhelming to teachers who are new to UDL, but even to teachers who are experienced with UDL. And one of the things that we do, I did in my dissertation work and we really focus on at CAST, is really trying to work with teachers to identify particular problems of practice that they're experiencing in their own classrooms or challenges that they're experiencing. And then, then think about how might the guidelines be applied to address those challenges or to reduce those barriers. So that we're trying to kind of contextualize it as much as we can to what matters most to teachers. So oftentimes if I'm working with a teacher, even thinking about my dissertation that um, the fourth grade teacher had, she was in the midst of a narrative writing unit and she was um, working on developing a lesson plan to support students to be crafting really strong conclusions to their narratives. And she was saying, you know, this has not, this lesson hasn't worked for me in the past. There are all these barriers embedded. I'm getting nervous about implementing it this year. You know, can you help me? And that was just such a perfect place to start because it was this real problem of practice that she was feeling. And then we were able to use UDL and say, okay, let's use this framework. What, are, what is your goal here? What are those barriers that some of your students have experienced in the past? What are those barriers you might be anticipating for this group of students? And how might we apply UDL to reduce those barriers? And I think it is just thinking about, let's just start with applying one or two, bar one or two guidelines that make sense 
to support students in achieving that learning goal. And I think it is starting with something that feels real to teachers, a real challenge. I think that can be a really motivating way to start playing around with UDL. That's great, that's great. So I'm watching the time and I'm supposed to be playing Brian Dean's role, I'm not very good at it. I know we're running up on, on some time, but, um, uh, and we'll send, I know Louie's got a, has a question in there and we'll send that directly off to Jenna, uh, but, um, on, and maybe she'll answer it over, over uh, Twitter. Um, where is this stuff can be published about your dissertation? It's always uh, the kind of the thorn in the side of the dissertation. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I did have a piece just come out um, that describes the, my qualifying paper, the pilot study that I just referred to. So that piece is out, um, but I'm still working on getting those dissertation articles published. So I'll keep you posted. <laughs> yeah, so reach out to Jenna on Twitter and keep bugging her about that because it's important stuff. And I just recommend <laughs> everyone reaching out to Jenna uh, on Twitter. She, she would appreciate that, I'm sure. <laughs> oh, definitely. Yeah. It'll give me more motivation to get those, <laughs> those drafts out the door. Um, there was a, there was a, another great question by, uh, um, down beneath there. I think Lisa sent it in on, on just real quickly, just one specific example of learning environment design. I think you guys kind of maybe sprinkled some throughout, but can you explicitly give like one example very quickly here in the next minute because I know we have to kind of pay the bills here in a minute too so and kind sure. of talk a little bit about what's going on a real specific example of environmental design learning okay. environment design so so I would say something like um you look at the guidelines to really think about um what you're building in proactively so if you just start with the access role of the guidelines you might identify a low-tech kit in your environment and you're going to fill that with a variety of like what we used to call assistive writing tools that now any student can access or highlighters or sticky notes um, something like that you might um, dedicate some class time to teaching your students how to use the options that exist in the operating system of the computer so they can customize their display or they can use text-to-speech um, you might also build in opportunities for students to share experience with the whole group, like a community circle, or also through anonymous system, like getting survey feedback at the end of the week. Um, just thinking about like using those guidelines to identify proactive examples that you can put in ahead of time, um, regardless of, of what you're teaching. And then that naturally enhances the overall lesson in the unit. And there's thousands of examples. That was just a quick one thinking about just the access row. Yeah, I think it's perfect. In fact, the guidelines website has some really nice examples laid into the guidelines website if you want to look at it from that sort of perspective. Kate, mm -hmm. Jenna, do you want to just share any quick sort of uh, really explicit things? Yeah, I just have a quick one from even yesterday. Um, again, kind of a simple access type representation um, piece. Uh, the teacher was expecting students to refer back to a slide on the screen for directions for an activity that I was watching. And um, I suggested just make the screen have higher contrast and a bigger font. Um, and then also could the students have a paper copy at their tables so that they can refer, have, refer back to the instructions for the lesson and the activity in, a, in an easier way. So that's a simple thing she can do um, and think about from, from now on to have in place for her students. And the one particular student that I was observing um, that she was, her problem of practice that she was um, just trying to figure out that will work for him, but that will work for a lot of other students as well. Okay, great. You want to throw into that, Jenna, or you just want to I think we've got it covered since we only have one minute left. I don't yeah, want to, exactly. I don't want to take like up our remaining left. minute. Okay, perfect. <laughs> those are great examples. Yeah, those are great examples. I was also going to just throw in one from um, that we use all the time and uh, is actually gathering student voice and finding different ways to gather student voice throughout the environment to make sure that they're actively involved in helping uh, support the design of the environment and using things like entry tickets and exit tickets and just little things they could do throughout the room together, little pieces of data of student voice. So that's great. And I was going to ask a research question, but we don't have time. You now we have to pay the bills. Uh, so am I handing it back to you, Corinne? Is this how this works? I don't really know how it works. Yep, yep. You can hand it back to me, Jamie. Okay. I'll take it from here. Um, so if for any of you who have additional questions for um, either Jenna or Kate or Liz, 
Um, their Twitter handles are listed um, on the slide deck. Um, we'll be getting that out to you. This um, session is gonna be recorded and posted on the UDLIRN website. So you can go back there and, um, but I'm, I'm confident that if you, um, if you get in touch with them, they'll be happy to provide lots more um, insights and examples. So um, our, our apologies for not having time for more questions. Um, we've, uh, so um, we're gonna go now and just, we hope that you enjoyed the evening. If you did, if you like what you heard, you wanna hear more of this type of thing, um, not, not the what is UDL, but really, how, how do I do UDL? How do I help support learning in others? How do I help support implementation in my own classroom and someone else's classroom? How do I improve my coaching practices? Um, uh, how do I influence decisions at the state or administrative levels in my district? I mean, the, the real meat of moving forward in practice, I, we hope that you can join us at the summit. Um, so this is the information, it's, it's uh, coming up in April, just, um, just a, a short uh, month away from us here. And um, there's just a ton of options. This is a really, um, Liz mentioned, um, designing for UDL. This is a UDL uh, designed conference for sure. So lots of, lots of options, lots of interaction. Um, the, if you want to um, check out Twitter, gives you a little bit of a, of a flavor of all the different choices you have in terms of engaging with content and networking and um, all the choices involved there. It's really an, an amazing experience. Um, if you liked what you heard tonight and you wanna hear more, cause I know I'll be adding some of these sessions to my schedule for the conference, but um, Kate and Jenna and Liz will have multiple sessions and we'll be talking more in depth about some of the work that they're doing at the conference. So make sure that you, if you're going to go and visit them and hear and learn more. Um, a quick reminder, if you are going, make sure you reserve your room by April 3rd, if possible. That's when the, the discount rate ends, so discount code UDL when you go to reserve your room. And um, also, if for those of you who aren't able to, um, to join us in Orlando, there's going to be a streaming pass available. So for a nominal fee, you can sign up for a streaming pass and have the opportunity to um, stream some of the content um, from the conference. So those tickets will be available. Um, um, you can check back at the, the IRN website early April, April, those tickets should be available then. And um, the last thing is, if you like this kind of content, we offer these sessions monthly, and uh, as well as a UDL chat that happens the first and third Wednesday of the month on Twitter. So make sure to check out, um, join that too, can you get your UDL boost in between the UDL uh, IRN network and learn sessions. Um, a huge thank you to our panelists. Thank you, Jenna and Liz and Kate for sharing um, your wealth of knowledge, for sharing all of your experiences. Thanks to Jamie and Mackenzie for running all the back channel stuff. Um, we appreciate it. And thank you, thank you for everybody who's joined us tonight um, for your contributions and for your passion and, and helping move UDL forward. So hope everybody has a good night and hope that you join us again next month.